The next item of business is a statement by Paul Wheelhouse on publication of the Scottish Energy Strategy. The Minister will take questions at the end of his statement and that so there should be no interventions or interruptions. And I call on Paul Wheelhouse. Ten minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, today, with the publication of Scotland's energy strategy, uh, we mark a significant advance in Scottish Government energy policy and indeed energy policy for this Parliament. It follows a major process of consultation which covered not only the draft energy strategy but detailed matters relating to onshore wind, Scotland's energy efficiency programme, the development of local heat and energy efficiency strategies and district heating regulation. And the strategy we're publishing today is fully in line with our draft climate change plan and it supports our programme for government commitments and our ambitions for sustainable growth. It also sends a series of clear messages our determination, uh, determination sorry, presiding officer, to decarbonise, our commitment to support the innovation and evolution of our energy system, our focus on inclusion and economic benefit and the development of supply chain opportunities. And we make plain to the wider world that Scotland is an open, modern and excellent location for energy investment and collaboration. The strategy is accompanied by the onshore and wind policy statement, uh, confirming the value of onshore wind to Scotland's energy system, our economy and communities. And presiding officer, 2017 has been an important year for the energy sector. We've seen dramatic reductions in the cost of offshore wind and more success for Scottish projects in securing long-term contracts at auction. These developments and others in sectors like floating wind energy, wave and tidal power generation provide a huge opportunity for the Scottish supply chain. Our programme for government announced by the First Minister contained new commitments on electric and other low emission vehicles and our intention to support up to £60 million of new innovation funding under the Low Carbon Innovation Fund, setting Scotland apart as a country at the vanguard of the global move to low carbon energy systems. Scotland is also leading the way in promoting community and locally owned ener uh, renewable energy, well ahead of the rest of the UK, giving the people in those areas a genuine stake in the nature and operation of their energy systems. And I can announce today that the latest figures from the Energy Saving Trust show an estimated 666 megawatts of community and locally owned renewable capacity is now operating in Scotland, an increase of 12% from last year's figure. I, I firmly believe that people want more opportunities like this and we will continue to work with industry and communities to make that a reality. Our local heat and energy efficiency strategies will set out a long-term prospectus for investment in new energy efficiency, district heating and other heat decarbonisation programmes. Indeed, a second consultation is now underway on the detail of these proposals. The strategy itself includes our vision for 2050 of a flourishing competitive energy sector delivering secure, affordable and clean energy for Scotland's household, communities and businesses. Scotland's social and economic well-being and the sustainable productivity and competitiveness of our economy depend upon secure, affordable and reliable energy supplies. We can build on Scotland's existing industrial strengths, including harnessing the capabilities of our world-class oil and gas sector and leading industrial clusters such as Grangemouth, as well as the growing strength we have in all areas of renewable energy. Scotland's businesses are also well placed to capture the economic benefits of developing and pioneering new approaches. Smarter ways to generate and store renewable energy and monitor energy use can open up fresh opportunities for consumers with applications and technologies which can reduce both carbon emissions and energy bills. The move to electric and ultra low emission vehicles will create both opportunities and challenges for our electricity and transport systems. A coordinated approach involving all stakeholders will help us understand and tackle these opportunities and challenges in the best way possible. And Scotland's energy efficiency programme places a renewed emphasis on reducing the energy consumption of our buildings and decarbonising their heat. Our earlier designation of energy efficiency as a national infrastructure priority underlines the economic benefits of these kinds of investment. And we are determined to make our energy system as inclusive as possible, protecting and informing but also involving and empowering Scotland's consumers. However, for far too many households, energy is still unaffordable and the market is failing many Scottish consumers. Many of those fuel poor households are part of a significant group who do not switch suppliers and are therefore on some of the most expensive energy tariffs. So while recent moves by the UK government to cap tariffs for certain consumers may help to reduce bills, that may be insufficient in isolation and there, these must form part of a wider effort to ensure a fairer market for all. And that is why in October the First Minister announced the ambition to establish a new energy company. The aim is that this company will support economic development and contribute to tackling fuel poverty as well as being owned by the people of Scotland and run on a not-for-profit basis. It's important to seek views and expertise as we further develop this proposal. 
Uh, early feedback on the strategy consultation has been constructive and we're grateful for this input. In just one of these responses, the University of Edinburgh's Department for Social Responsibility and Sustainability said they would, and I quote, welcome exploration of a place for a government-owned energy company to act on a non-profit basis, addressing market failures to assist in lessening instances of fuel poverty, unquote. Following the announcement of our aim in October, Dermot Nolan, uh, Chief Executive of Ofgem, was widely quoted as saying Ofgem would, and I quote, welcome any form of potential new entry, unquote, into the energy market. And we today commit to a formal process of public consultation in the later part of 2018. Presenting Officer Scotland has always set a high bar when it comes to our energy potential and goals, and we are internationally recognised for the strength of our commitment to the development of renewable energy, particularly in electricity. I can confirm today that we're building on that progress by adopting two new and ambitious targets for 2030. Firstly, the equivalent of 50% of Scotland's total energy consumption for heat, transport and electricity to be supplied from renewable sources. And this demonstrates our commitment to a low carbon energy system and to underpinning the continued successful growth of the renewable energy sector in Scotland. Secondly, an increase of 30% in the productivity of our energy use across the Scottish economy. And this means delivering more economic output for each unit of energy consumed across the economy. And alongside these important targets, we've developed six new strategic priorities, which I'll summarize briefly. Firstly, we will make greater efforts than ever to protect consumers from excessive costs, while helping them take advantage of new opportunities arising from energy. Secondly, we'll continue to prioritize energy efficiency, supporting and improving the efficient use of energy in Scotland's homes, buildings, industrial processes, and manufacturing. Thirdly, we'll continue to champion Scotland's renewable energy potential with an ever greater focus on creating new jobs and supply chain opportunities. Fourthly, we'll ensure that Scotland's homes and businesses can continue to depend on secure, resilient and flexible energy supplies. Fifthly, we'll empower our communities by supporting innovative and integrated local energy systems and networks to help drive both local community and economic regeneration. And we will continue to support investment and innovation across our oil and gas sector, including exploration, innovation, subsea engineering, decommissioning and carbon capture utilisation and storage. The strategy includes a range of actions to deliver our goals. We have committed up to £20 million through an energy investment fund to support and stimulate renewable and low carbon energy investments in 2018-19. And this will build on the success of the Renewable Energy Investment Fund. Expansion of the funding support to include low, low carbon technologies alongside renewables will ensure that future investment reflects the wider systems approach and local energy ambitions being encouraged within the strategy. Presiding officer, today we are also publishing our onshore wind policy statement. We expect onshore wind to play a growing and invaluable role in our transition to a low carbon future. The support and investment frameworks for onshore wind have fundamentally changed, just as the technology is also changing with moves towards larger, more efficient turbines which have made onshore wind highly cost effective. We are determined to help secure a route to market for new developments through policy changes at a UK-wide level and through our actions of our own. Our planning system already makes positive and practical provision for onshore wind, protecting our landscapes and ensuring that development goes ahead only in the right places. And that will remain the case and ensure that onshore wind can continue to power Scotland's low carbon future while involving, regenerating and benefiting local communities. Presiding officer, today's publication marks the next stage of a process rather than a full stop. We are determined to increase public and business engagement on our energy future. People are much more aware, interested and informed about energy issues, not just policy, but the ways in which technological and other changes can give households, businesses and communities more options and more control. As we move ahead, we need to take all of society with us. Together with the final climate change plan and Scotland's energy efficiency programme, uh, we will develop a new approach, drawing on experts from a range of backgrounds. We will monitor the strategy annually, working closely with the Scottish Energy Advisory Board and its industry leadership groups. We expect to publish the first annual statement in 2019. Presiding Officer Scotland has world-class skills, expertise and knowledge from the North Sea oil and gas industry to our growing renewable energy sector, our academic institutions and our smaller startups. This strategy recognises and builds on our past, on our achievements to date and on Scotland's capacity for innovation. It forms, confirms the vital role of energy efficiency, of our renewables potential and our desire to develop new local energy systems and to develop the Scottish supply chain to deliver a sustainable energy future. And it places consumers and their interests more firmly than ever at the heart of everything that we do. And I commend Scotland's energy strategy to Parliament.
The Minister will now take questions on the issues raised in the statement, and I will allow around 20 minutes for that. Um, could members please press the request to speak buttons, please? And Alexander Burnett. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and can I thank the Minister for early sight of his statement today on the Scottish Government's energy strategy. And can I also note my register of interest, particularly in relation to businesses involved in renewable energy. Now, the publication of this strategy was long overdue, and disappointingly, the delay does not appear to have resulted in more substance. Now, we welcome the overarching goals for 2050, and the support and recognition of Scotland's island wind, and the UK's government's role in the Contracts for Difference process. However, the remainder of the strategy provides no detail of what should be achieved and how between now and 2050. The only indication of further detail is the route map for Scotland's energy efficiency programme, which will not appear until May next year. And of the six pages of strategic priorities, only two Scottish government actions give financial commitments. The remainder consists of promises of further engagement, further development of aims, and mere words of support. Once again, this is a government strategy, long on rhetoric, but short on detail. So can I ask the Minister, as this again looks like a draft strategy, when will we see some details of targets and actions to be achieved before 2050? Thank you. Paul Wheelhouse. <clears throat> Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, and uh, I just want to point out a few things to Mr Burnett through, through yourself, Presiding Officer. Firstly, uh, this is not delayed at all. Uh, we, we published the, the draft strategy in January for consultation by the end of May. We committed to publish the strategy by the end of this year and we have delivered on our commitment to do so. So for Mr Burnett to claim that it's been delayed um, is uh, perhaps I, I can understand the industry's uh, excitement about the strategy being published because they strongly support the direction of travel in which the Scottish Government is going and obviously we're eager to see the final document but Mr Burnett is frankly wrong uh, that this is delayed at all. And in terms of the detail, I, I would challenge him in that um, uh, this is a process that has involved uh, considerable consultation with the Scottish Energy Advisory Board and the industry, and they're strongly supportive of a list of actions that we've published here. This is to be seen in concert with the Climate Change Plan, uh, which will be published early in the new year, and uh, it has been developed using the timed model. It's a, a very thorough document. It's one that is warmly welcomed by industry, and indeed we understand the UK government is looking very closely at taking a similar line uh, to the Scottish Government in the approach we have taken to a whole system approach here. So just as in many other decisions that we have taken ahead of UK ministers, whether it's on underground coal gasification, I believe in due course on fracking as well, I think Mr Burnett will find that the UK Government has uh, plans to take a similar approach to the Scottish Government in this respect. Jackie Bailey. Could I thank the Minister for advance copy of his statement? There is much to welcome in the energy strategy, but as ever, uh, government will be judged by its actions. The Minister talks about the renewable sector's potential and having an even greater focus on creating new jobs and supply chain opportunities, and we agree. It's fair to say that the major investment in renewables so far has not led to a significant number of jobs or supply chain opportunities retained in Scotland. He will be well aware of the recent problems with BIFAB and I welcome the efforts of the workforce, the trade unions and indeed the Scottish Government in ensuring the future of the yards. However, it's clearly the case that the overwhelming majority of the investment in, say, the Beatrice project, to take one example, has gone overseas. £6 billion of development with less than 4% of that value being retained in Scottish manufacturing. And I say it's surely not beyond us to retain a greater proportion of work and jobs at home. There is scant detail in the energy strategy that tells us how you will do that, so can the Minister tell us now what he will do to ensure that opportunities turn into reality? Paul Wheelhouse. Well, I, th I thank uh, Jackie Bailey for the constructive tone in which she has addressed her question. I, I would certainly reiterate the point I've said in my statement that we propose to, to monitor uh, the delivery on, and I, I fully accept we have to deliver on a strategy now we have it, and to report annually on it. So you can judge us as we go ahead, and I'm sure Ms Bailey will do that in her usual robust style. 
um, but, and I look forward to engaging with her on that. Um, but there are, she is right to identify, there are some examples of projects which have a low uh, Scottish content, low UK content even, which is, I know, frustrating to UK ministers and, to, of course, to ourselves and the Scottish Government. Uh, there are some really good examples, like Nova Innovations Project up on the Blue Mill Sound, I think was 80% Scottish supply chain, that is a, a, you know, an exemplar, um, but we have to try and make sure that the more projects are hitting that kind of milestone if, if we can achieve that. Um, I, I'm not sure, I don't recognise the, the, the full figures that she said in relation to, to Beatrice, so apologies, presiding officer, but happily look at that, but we understand there's a higher percentage share than I think was implied by Jackie Bailey in her response. And of course, the operation and maintenance expenditure will all be local through harbours like Wick, which is being uh, widely uh, regenerated, which is obviously a very welcome development. But I want to reassure Ms Bailey and members in the chamber that we are taking the issue of supply chain content extremely seriously. I've chosen the flag up in the strategy as an, a, a strong priority for the government. And through the uh, groups like the Offshore Wind Industry Group, which has a specific supply chain focus and the increased focus of the oil and gas industry leadership group on supply chain issues, I, I promise uh, Ms Bailey and others that we are taking ever greater interest in this. But uh, judge us on our record and I'm sure Ms Bailey and others will do so. I have quite a few requests to speak, so if we're fairly succinct, everyone should get in. Richard Lockhead, followed by Donald Cameron. And I welcome the Minister's statement, and particularly the progress on community and locally owned renewable energy, and his comments on the work that's taking place to establish a publicly owned energy company in Scotland. Can you reassure the Chamber that such a company will be the heart of his energy strategy going forward, given that in today's society we still experience unacceptable levels of fuel poverty and much of the profits exploited from energy resources in this country go overseas. And therefore, a publicly owned energy company is one way in which the people of Scotland can get much more benefit from the abundance of energy resources on their own doorstep. Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, well, I, I thank uh, Mr Lockett for his question. He, he hits on an issue which is really important. Um, clearly, the uh, strategy clearly uh, states our rationale for setting a, a new ambition, ambition of a new energy company, uh, largely being around uh, the levels of fuel poverty that are in Scottish society being unacceptably high. And in 2016, 26.5% of Scottish households were fuel poor, poor at that point, and many of those fuel poor households are part of a significant group that we know do not switch suppliers, which is, uh, is proving very sticky in the market that people aren't switching for less expensive energy tariffs. And we set out the, the intention uh, in terms of our, uh, uh, the, the energy strategy of um, putting in place our, our ambition around setting up an energy company vehicle that supports economic development, but crucially, uh, also contributing to tackling uh, the drivers of fuel poverty in Scotland. And we will consult on that uh, in the course of 2018. And that will be a formal consultation which will give opportunities to all stakeholders, including members across this chamber, to feed their thoughts in and to the uh, role and remit of such a, an organisation. But central to our concern is around uh, the level of trust that consumers in Scotland have in the energy market uh, and, uh, and the need to improve our approach to tackling inequality and promoting inclusive growth. So uh, I certainly welcome Mr Lockhart's interest. I know he has had a long-standing interest in this issue, uh, both as a minister and a backbencher, and uh, I look forward to working with him and others in the chamber to bring this uh, forward in due course. Donald Cameron, followed by Lewis MacDonald. Thank you. Can I refer to renewable energy in my register of interest? Uh, notwithstanding the comments in the statement uh, and in the onshore wind policy statement, does the minister genu genuinely believe that wild land can be protected whilst at the same time delivering increased onshore wind? And does he recognise the very significant concerns of many environmental groups, as well as a huge number of local communities who feel that our natural landscape has already been comp compromised by onshore wind? Paul Wheelhouse. Um, well, I, I wouldn't have today uh, time presiding off to go through the onshore wind policy statement, but we do recognise these issues in the document that this, uh, obviously our twin ambitions of improving our performance in terms of delivering renewable energy uh, have to be taken in the context of protecting important landscapes as best we can uh, and taking full account of uh, those issues in considering planning applications. Uh, both the Cabinet Secretary and myself, who consider Section 36 consents for over 50 megawatt projects, is very much part of our consideration looking at wildland issues. It's not a formal designation, as, as Mr Cameron knows, but it's also uh, important that we recognise that within the process. That's an improvement we've made to the planning system in Scotland, and I think it's one that's been warmly welcomed. There are a number of sites which have uh, not entirely been rejected on the grounds of wildland, but it's been a contributory factor to a, a rejection of a planning application. Equally, we don't want to portray a picture that wildland will be a barrier to development of sensible projects in good locations. And uh, so it's obviously a matter that we balance against other factors such as economic impact and, and contributing to tackling climate change, which should be a priority for us all in this chamber. Lewis MacDonald, followed by John Mason. 
Thank you very much. The Minister described six new strategic priorities, all of which I thought I recognised as the existing and indeed the well-established energy priorities of his government. Can he tell us what is new about these priorities and in particular uh, what new initiatives he will now take to support investment and innovation across our oil and gas sector? Paul Wheelhouse. Well, uh, I welcome Mr Macdonald's comments. I mean, he is right that there is some consistency in terms of some of the priorities we've taken forward, but we have provided a lot of detail uh, in terms of each of the six priorities, uh, specific actions we propose to take forward in relation to them all. Uh, I suppose it's a reassurance that our, broadly our strategy has been along the right lines, obviously informed by members in this chamber, but also stakeholders outside the chamber. But we're putting some meat on the bones in terms of specific actions we want to take forward. He, he mentioned specifically oil and gas, um, which I, so I just want to uh, respect the, the point he's raised there by saying that we are obviously taking forward a new forum to help us uh, take forward work with academia and industry around CCS and hydrogen, which uh, is part of enabling the industry to have a part in the low carbon transition. Uh, we want to commission evidence on the impact of technolo technology around uh, and market barriers, regulatory barriers around hydrogen and CCUS um, opportunities in Scotland. We are supporting the ACORN uh, carbon capture and storage project at St Fergus in the northeast of Scotland. And we uh, are going to continue to work with the UK Government and Oil and Gas Authority to progress those Scottish uh, carbon capture, usage and storage uh, interests. So there's a number of measures there which I, I can direct Mr Macdonald to and we'll perhaps give him in, in letter form a full detail there. But, uh, but I want to reassure him that uh, we are putting meat on the bones in each of these strategic priorities. John Mason, followed by Matt Ruskell. Thank you. Uh, the Minister talked about smarter ways of storing energy. And I wonder if he could expand at all about how he thinks uh, we can expand uh, Scotland's capacity for storage of energy. Sorry, Paul Fielhuis. <laughs> Sorry, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, well, Mr Mason raises an important point. Storage is critical, not just to our own approach, but that of the UK government as well, and indeed internationally it's becoming uh, a greater uh, than, e than ever focus on energy policy in the areas of storage. And the application of storage technologies will be strategically important and deliver real benefits for Scotland, uh, and uh, the hence we place a great emphasis on it in our strategy. We obviously in Scotland have existing capacity in terms of pumped hydro storage, and we believe that is also crucial uh, in this area, and Scotland already hosts key facilities such as at Kruken and the Foyers, which are providing a facility for the GB system. And these stations can store large amounts of water, releasing that energy when demand on the system is high and indeed are crucial for Black Start capabilities as well. We also believe investment in new pumped hydro storage capacity would greatly enhance the flexibility and resilience of our electricity network. But we're also working on areas such as uh, smart systems and the UK smart systems and flexibility plan. Uh, we believe re regulatory changes are crucial for increasing uh, Scotland's storage capacity in relation to that. And we also support uh, Ofgem's ongoing work to facilitate uh, co-location of storage and renewables obligation and feed-in tariff accredited projects to try and experiment with how we make use of storage to support intermittent sources of energy uh, to become a more reliable um, uh, feature in terms of both Black Star and, and providing uh, resilience in the system, which I'm, I'm convinced they can do if we get this strategy right. Mark Ruskell, followed by Graham Day. Thank you. Can I welcome this energy strategy, and in particular the green box on page 63, which embeds the fracking ban into the energy strategy in the way which the Green Party requested in this parliament just a few weeks ago. But can I just ask about waste incineration, Minister, because we see 11 waste incinerators that have either been built or are being proposed in Scotland at the moment. This is raising concerns about our ability to meet Scotland's recycling, increase in our recycling rate. There are concerns about the impact on communities. And many developers are actually citing the market downturn in the value of recyclers as a reason for why more incinerators should be built. It's clearly there's a loophole in the waste regulations here. So why is there no reference to energy from waste in the energy strategy? And when will the Scottish Government actually review this? Paul Wheelhouse. Well, I certainly recognise there's strong community interest in issues such as waste incineration. Um, our, our strategy sets out, we're not um, uh, wanting to be uh, tied to any specific technology. I'm sure Mr Ruskell, who's, who's very experienced in these matters, will see in the strategy we're not being specific about which technologies dominate in 2050. Indeed, we set out some scenarios around the greater use of electricity or hydrogen just to present some alternative pathways. When it comes to issues like waste um, uh, to energy projects, uh, the, the specific issues that Mark Ruskell raises are ones that I'm happy to engage with him on uh, with colleagues such as Rosanna Cunningham, who clearly has responsibility in areas of recycling and waste. So I don't want to tread on uh, Ms Cunningham's uh, toes in terms of portfolio responsibilities, but I'm happy to engage with Mr Ruskell to understand better the concerns he has and the communities he represents. And we'll obviously take that in, in the round. This is a living document. It will be updated as time goes on. 
We've got a chance for Parliament to influence it as we go forward, and we hopefully will report back in the response I gave to Ms Bailey about performance as we go on as well. It's quite clear I'm not going to get through all these question requests, but could we speed up a bit, please, with both questions and answers? Graham Day, followed by Liam MacArthur. Thank you. I wonder if the Minister might outline the role he sees for offshore wind in the delivery of Queen Green Energy, particularly in the first of fourth and Tay. And can I ask him how the Scottish Government will facilitate progress on those developments off the coast of Angus and Fife so we can recover some of the near three-year delay caused by the failed legal challenge which was mounted against them? Paul Wheelhouse. Um, well, it, 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 because of brevity, I'll, I'll focus on two things. I mean, firstly, uh, we are very strongly supportive of off offshore wind development. We believe it's highly cost competitive in comparison with nuclear energy. Uh, we know that the price, the strike price that's been agreed by UK government is around £92.50 per megawatt hour for Hinkley C. It is in the region of £57.50 per megawatt hour for the latest Murray uh, offshore uh, project. And indeed, the fourth and Tay projects are seeking to bid for, uh, in the case of Norton Aguirre, there's already a CFD uh, secured, but um, other three sites are, are yet to secure CFD uh, contract for difference, presiding officer. And uh, that is very important. We expect them to be very competitive projects, and this is driving down the cost of electricity for consumers, whereas nuclear is potentially pushing it up. But we do strongly support it. We are working closely with stakeholders like the RSPB, um, renewable energy developers themselves, and the conservation agencies to ensure that we take a balanced approach to developing this technology, uh, which is vital for a low-carbon future, but also protecting and enhancing the wildlife. And we're keen to engage positively with all parties, and I'm confident we can do so. Liam MacArthur, followed by Ruth McGuire. Thank you. Can I uh, welcome the publication of the strategy and also declare uh, that I am in receipt of both FIT and RHI payments. Uh, given its uh, strategic uh, priority, what assurances can the Minister give that the upcoming Warm Homes Bill will contain ambitious measures to improve energy efficiency? And given that consumers uh, across the Highlands and Islands, including in Orkney, pay a surcharge of 2p a unit for energy at the same time as having the highest levels of fuel poverty uh, in the country, what steps will he take to make the case for socialising energy costs across the country. Paul Wheelhouse. Well, clearly, um, we are already con uh, continuing to commit significant funding uh, for tackling uh, energy efficiency in our housing stock. It's one area where, uh, sadly, I think uh, comparable schemes in the rest of the UK have has ceased, but the Scottish Government has committed half a billion uh, pounds over the lifetime of this Parliament uh, to supporting the rollout of SEEP. And clearly, we are looking at some very uh, innovative and important projects, including in uh, Mr MacArthur's own constituency through uh, low carbon tra uh, infrastructure transition uh, pro uh, uh, program and also the um, seat pilots as well to ensure that we are um, developing the right approaches in the right circumstances with uh, taking some of the learning out for, for private sector so that um, we can de-risk investment in this area and a total of about 10 billion pounds is estimated to be the cost to bring our housing stock and energy efficiency standards up to the, the levels we want to attain by 2030 and clearly we want to work the private sector. So the programmes we put in place which are substantially funded uh, by this government uh, uh, well, I hope will benefit Mr MacArthur's constituency and will look to develop the supply chain opportunities in areas like Orkney to support that work at a local level. Ruth Maguire followed by Morris Golden. Presiding officer, earlier this year the First Minister opened the world's first floating wind farm. Does the Minister agree that this venture is testament to the huge renewable potential of our seas and can he confirm the Scottish Government's future plans for this technology in Scottish waters? Paul Wheelhouse. I, I could certainly uh, concur with uh, Ruth Maguire. It, it, High Wind is a, a very exciting project. It's perhaps one that, um, because of its innovative nature and the nature of its, its origins, we didn't secure as much supply chain opportunity in that as we'd like, but it's crucially demonstrating the, uh, the deployment of that technology in the Scottish context, and we are confident it's already helping to drive further interest and investment in offshore floating wind. Um, the Crown Estate Scotland is already taking forward plans for further licensing rounds up to 2030 and is specifically looking at what provision can be made for both uh, fixed traditional offshore wind but now increasingly floating offshore wind which will hopefully benefit many constituencies across the country and uh, I look forward to working with both Crown Estate Scotland and Marine Scotland in doing that. Maurice Golden followed by Claudia Beamish. What level of feasibility has been undertaken to establish the commercial and operational viability of the state-owned energy company? Paul Wheelhouse. I set out in my response to Mr Lockhead, uh, considerable work is going on at this time to, to establish um, the, uh, uh, the nature of the, the challenges we face. It is a challenging 
thing, as I'm sure Mr. Golden uh, would recognise, to create an uh, energy company. And uh, we have uh, been doing work extensively with uh, stakeholders, but we propose to have a formal consultation in the next year. At this present time, we're working on a strategic case which is being developed um, through private contract uh, to help support the government in terms of providing the necessary underpinning analysis that would allow us to take forward our work. And, but I hope that in due course, um, we're able to talk more of that with, uh, I'm sure, Mr. Golden's interest. I'd be happy to discuss it with him. But um, we are doing the necessary due diligence. It's a very serious issue, but I can assure members in this chamber that we're taking it very seriously. And the last question in this statement is Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Building on the last question, um, can the Minister give any more detail of the proposed energy company from the feedback uh, on the strategy consultation, particularly um, how this not-for-profit company will help tackle fuel poverty, not least in rural Scotland? Paul Wheelhouse. Well, clearly, um, in terms of the, uh, the points I've made in my, my statement, we've identified that uh, state, a number of stakeholders are very supportive of the principle of us taking forward this work. And indeed, it was very welcome that uh, Ofgem have been widely quoted as being supportive of our, our efforts here. Um, it has only been 71 days. I'm reminded, had to remind myself since the announcement in October, and perhaps it's, it's, it's not um, uh, reasonable to be expected to provide a blueprint at this point in time. But I want to assure Claudia Beamish, and I know other members in the chamber who've expressed interest both through parliamentary questions and other routes, that uh, fuel poverty is uh, a key uh, driver for why we are trying to do this. Um, we obviously have an interest in protecting consumers. There are innovative ideas around price caps and other measures that have been put forward, but clearly we think in isolation that may not be successful in its own right and uh, competition within the market has, has increased over recent years and the shape market dominance of the big six has actually slipped back from 98% in 2013 to around 80% today and that is thought to be one uh, means by which um, downward pressure can be maintained on prices. But I'm happy to engage with Claudia Beamish as our plans come forward. That concludes questions on the publication of the Scottish Energy Strategy. Apologies to those who wished to ask questions and weren't able to.